Today's episode of The Overwhelmed Brain is brought to you by Casper. Get $50 toward any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com forward slash brain. Use the promo code brain when checking out and you get 50 bucks off an excellent mattress. Relax into that deal. Are you annoyed by affirmations? Isn't it even more annoying when that one person decides to espouse their infinite wisdom on you, especially at the most inappropriate time? If anyone knows any reason why this couple should not be joined in holy matrimony, let them speak now or forever hold their peace. (laughs) Why do they even ask that question during a wedding? The reverend might as well say, Hey everyone! I don't want this couple to get married, so someone please speak up so I can stop this debacle. (laughs) Well, I say, think positively. This marriage is going to be great, and there better be no one here interrupting it, or they'll have to answer to me. Now, let's keep this wonderfully peaceful and loving vibe going by listening intently to the following silence in a non-awkward manner. Well, go on, Rev. Don't keep the lovely couple waiting. Were you even invited? If affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like denial, then get ready to start creating the life you've always wanted now. Hello, this is Paul Coliani, your personal empowerment coach. Yes, I'm a coach, not just a podcaster. (laughs) I am the host of The Overwhelmed Brain, and this is the personal growth show for the critical thinker. On every episode, we'll talk about practical, down-to-earth steps to help you improve your mood and keep you sane in this powerful journey we call life. I want to help you bridge the gap between your emotions and reason causing you to discover why you do the things you do and what you can do to reach higher levels of happiness and lower levels of stress and overwhelm. And if you're here to learn more common sense tips for improving your life, well, you're in the wrong place. (laughs) I don't know who told you to come here for common sense because this is the direct path to uncommon sense. And that's why it's going to help you learn, heal, grow, and evolve. Now, at this point in the show, I usually have something to say Something so important that I think I need to share with the world. (laughs) But I guess that doesn't always happen. Like, what's on my mind? Hmm. And uh, what I typically do is read the emails ahead of time to find out what I want to talk about this week. And one of the emails has to do with anger. And so I sat here thinking, all right, I usually tell a personal story about a time I got angry you know, or any subject that I talk about. Like if the subject was about a relationship issue, then I would talk about a relationship issue at the beginning of the show. But this subject, or at least the first segment, is about someone who got angry, someone who, quote, lost it. And I've had an episode recently called Reaching That Snapping Point. I forget the whole title, but it was something something like that. So I'm thinking uh, as I sit here in real time going, hmm, what do I have to talk about where I got angry? And, you know, I'm one of those people that has always been quite passive externally. Internally, I was angry. I used to be very angry. But on the outside, you wouldn't be able to tell. People would see me smiling and I could smile through (laughs) getting my boundaries ripped apart by anyone. And okay, it's okay. I'll just sit back and let you violate my boundaries and walk all over me and take advantage of me because I was not able to stand up for myself. And, you know, that's a bad place to be. If you've been listening to the show a while, you know that I consistently remind you that honoring your boundaries is like one of the first steps that you need to do to start getting what you want in life honor your boundaries. And then some people say, I don't even know what my boundaries are. And that's another problem. If you don't know what your boundaries are, then how do you honor what you don't know? (laughs) It's hard. It is very hard. But, you know, there's an easy way to figure out what your boundaries are. And and I'm going to talk about anger in a second, but let's just go in this direction. Here is a question you can ask yourself 
about how to figure out what your boundaries are. Ask yourself this. What is something that happens in my life right now that I wish I could change? And whatever answer comes up for you is probably a boundary or related closely to a boundary. And if that question doesn't work, try this one. What is something that someone does to me that I wish would never happen again? Now, there's a more direct question because if you can come up with an answer for that and that person is still doing it, if not regularly, uh, at least infrequently or even frequently, then that helps you identify a boundary in you. For example, I've known people that do what I call (laughs) pre-obligate. Now, I love this word. I don't know if I made it up, but (laughs) it's something I thought of when I would be in a situation where I would have a friend that said, hey, give me your phone number. I want to give it to this person so they can call you for help developing their communication skills or something. And not as a coaching client, but as a favor to to someone I may not even know. It's like they are obligating me ahead of time to do something that I haven't even talked about with them nor agreed to yet. I know you probably know someone like this in your life, don't you? Where they talk to you as if you are going to agree with them and they bind you to a position that you feel uncomfortable with, or even if you don't feel uncomfortable and you might have said yes anyway, they're still binding you to that position, meaning uh, it's almost like you're forced to do it just to be nice. Oh, you're going to give my phone number to this person and you expect me to call them and and then help them over the phone and and who is this person again and why are you doing this without my permission? (laughs) And uh, the people that have done this in my life are clueless that it's even a problem. But when I think about it, uh, maybe a little anger comes up. It's like, why are you sharing my personal information with someone else? And why are you assuming that I will do it without even discussing it with me? I call that pre-obligation. If you've been looking for the word for that, (laughs) use that word. And don't say, don't pre-obligate me to do that. (laughs) So I think about the boundary that's being violated there. I mean, again, this is if you don't know what your boundary is, then you ask those two questions to yourself and you should come up with an answer or two. What is something someone does that I wish they would never do again? And that is pre-obligate me. Okay, what does that lead to? What is that boundary? Probably, It probably has to do with respect. Respect for my time. Respect for my privacy. Respect as a friend that won't share my information without my permission. I mean, it's all kind of related there, but, you know, respect is probably the bottom line. There's probably something else in there. But, you know, if I didn't know specifically what it was, I would probably just say, I want people to respect my time and energy and not obligate me to do things that I have not even talked to them about yet. And I think about that and I go, that shouldn't even be a boundary of mine. That should be automatic. (laughs) I shouldn't have to say that's a boundary of mine. But this is what happens. We find out that we have other boundaries that we didn't even know about because people do things that they haven't done or that haven't been done to us ever. (laughs) You know, something happens in our life and we go, wow, I don't like that when that person does that. They must be violating a boundary of mine that I didn't even know about. So that's what you can do is you can figure out who is doing things in your life that you don't like and you don't want and you wish they would never do again, that can point to a boundary. So there is a good way to figure out uh, what your boundaries are. And I started off this segment talking about anger because anger is usually something that happens when someone pushes you beyond your boundaries or opens the door to your boundaries and walks right in or something like that. Now, typically with anger, that usually develops because You let someone in to your boundaries. You let them walk in the door. Now, the key word is let. Did you really let them in? No, I didn't want them in. I didn't let them in. They just barged in. Yeah, but let's think about what they did. Let's say you're married and your spouse says, Hey, I'm calling my friends over and we're going to do something tonight at the house. And your spouse didn't discuss it with you ahead of time. And maybe it bothers you. 
maybe it bothers you that they did this and maybe they do it quite often. And you can say, whoa, 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 we didn't discuss this and I don't want anybody over tonight. Or you could swallow it and go, oh, I hate when he does that. Or I hate when she does that, <laughs> whoever it is. Most of my life, I swallowed it. Oh, oh, okay, uh, good to know. If someone does something that you don't particularly like and you didn't really have a choice in it, to me that feels like you're forcing me to accept this no matter what. It's just going to happen. And it doesn't feel very good. I feel like I have no power. Like you're not even considering me in the process of uh, doing things in our house. So that's a good example of maybe a boundary being crossed. And it's also a good example of that moment when you swallow the anger or express the anger. Because anger is a very powerful, resourceful state. It's a very healthy emotion to have. Because when you have anger, that means you're ready to take action. And the body and the mind want to take action when they're angry. When you're angry, your body and mind are ready to charge and take care of you. And that's the defensive anger. I'm ready to take care of me. And then there's the offensive anger where you're ready to take care of the other person <laughs> in another way, either by yelling, hitting, or worse. Defensive anger can be very powerful because it gives you power that you didn't know you had. Or even if you did know, it's still a very uh, empowering feeling being angry because that's when you are taking massive steps to change the situation. Or it goes inward. You repress it. You stuff it down. And it never comes out. And I tell you what, anger repressed is so much more destructive than anger expressed. Tweet that. <laughs> anger repressed is so much more destructive than anger expressed. And the reason is, is because you are destroying your inner world. You are slowly disintegrating yourself. Pushing that stuff down causes pain in you. Put, some people believe that pushing it down causes disease in you. Some people believe it causes cancer. Some people believe it causes a, a bunch of stuff. And I'm not saying it's the only cause, but I'm sure it doesn't help because when the body feels bad, it's not a healing state. A healing state is usually feeling better. I mean, you do go through some pain while you're healing, but the pain usually gets less and less while you're healing. That might be an overstatement, and I'm sorry if I simplified that. So if you're going through healing right now and you're in massive pain, forgive me. I don't mean to, again, simplify that. But I think you understand where I'm going with this because when you repress anger over and over and over again, you are causing pain in your body and you are also causing you to behave differently in your outer world. And that could mean not being able to honor your boundaries or choosing not to honor your boundaries because of fear. If I choose not to honor my boundaries because I am afraid of the consequences, I'm afraid of what might happen if I do honor my boundaries. But what a lot of people don't realize is that by choosing not to honor their boundaries, in an external way, in the real world, they are destroying themselves. I know that's kind of an exaggerated way to look at it, but really, long term, you are systematically disintegrating something inside of you. It eats away at you. And I know you feel it. If you are hanging on to anger or hate or resentment, any of those emotions or feelings that, that lead to anger, then you are hurting yourself. So it's important that you start honoring yourself and honoring your boundaries in a way where you don't repress anger. That's vital. And you can do it uh, resourcefully. You can do it in a way that's productive. You can do it in a healthy way that gives you power. And what I mean by that is when you are faced with the choice of repressing the anger or expressing it, in my opinion, most of the time, it is best to express it, but do it in a defensive way. 
not offensive. And I think that's the key and the difference between expressing it productively or not. So if you do it in a defensive way, like I am going to protect myself no matter what, and I'm going to stand up for myself, even if I have to be angry about it, I am angry because my boundaries are not being honored and I'm going to stand up for myself. That anger can turn into a real productive path to healthy living. Or you do it offensively. You son of a, I hate you and I'm going to throw all these words at you and I'm going to say all the things I've been meaning to say. And that is highly offensive. Um, Coming from a defensive place, but you are using anger. You are attacking in a way. And that puts you in a a place of power as well. However, what's the end result? And, you know, this is something that I'm not saying you have to do because there are times when defensive and offensive anger can be productive either way. Most of the time, defensive anger means you are protecting yourself and you're doing whatever you can to honor that person that is you, the only one you know best. The only one that you are right now on this planet, (laughs) listening to me, there's only one of you right now. So what's going to happen to that person that is you? You don't want to swallow anger. Yes, there are times where it's too dangerous and you can't show your anger because you might get attacked or abused or worse. And you do have, like I've said before, you do have to pick your battles. But there are also times where Enough is enough. You can't have your boundaries crossed all the time. You can't keep repressing the anger. What's it worth? Why is it worth more to honor the boundaries of others than to honor your own? Why is it worth staying in a job where you're continually abused in some way or disrespected in some way? Why is it a good thing to stay in a marriage where you're abused in some way or lied to or deceived? How much is it worth to get out of a situation that makes you miserable? That's the real question. How much is it worth? Is it worth coming to a place of anger inside of you where you go, enough is enough. I've had it. I will not take your abuse. I will not take your disrespect. I am sick and tired of living this way and I will not take it anymore. And what do you do from that point on? Well, you take steps. And things are either going to change Because from that point on, you won't swallow the anger anymore or things won't change. Because sometimes after we express it, (laughs) our anger in a defensive, productive way, we go back and go, oh, that was scary. I don't want to do that again. And then we go back to who we were and then we don't show that person again. I remember my mom did that. I remember that she told me, I think it was when I was 19 maybe, Uh, I heard her and my stepfather yelling downstairs. It was late at night, yelling and yelling. And and, and my mom was screaming and crying. And I was like, oh, my God, what's going on down there? And at 19, I was old enough to go down there and protect her and protect myself. I was big enough. I was strong enough to run down there and show some defensive anger or offensive anger if I had to. But I was too scared. I still had that scared child mind and I just could not go down and do it. I was just too scared. So I was in my bedroom, kind of the scared child that I had always been up to that point. And the memories go way back of just hearing my stepfather yelling in a drunken rage. And uh, But it wasn't often that I heard my mom yell back. And this was one of the first times I heard her yell back. But I think about it now and I think, wow, you know, I was old enough to go down there and alleviate the situation somehow, but I didn't have the knowledge, the skills, or the courage to start honoring my mom's boundaries and myself uh, at that time. So I didn't, and I swallowed whatever it was inside of me so I wouldn't be put in that situation. But my mom had to face that situation. My mom had to face it alone. And, you know, I I, I think back now going, oh, I should have done something. I should have went down there. Because what ended up happening in that moment was that she uh, picked up a TV (laughs) and threw it down on the floor because she was so angry at him. And it was one of the first times that she showed her anger like that to him. 
I don't remember what he did, but he saw a side of her that uh, he hadn't seen uh, probably in a long time or ever. And, you know, she finally stood up for herself. She didn't care what happened at that point. She just threw the TV down and yelled back. And then shortly after that, it was over. And knowing my stepfather, when he was not drinking, he was a very nice guy. And he apologized and he took her out and bought her things and everything was great again. And she decided instead of staying that person that honored herself in that moment, she went back to her passive way of being, letting him dominate once again for many, many years. I think she lost it like that, like three times in their entire 40-year relationship. And those three times, she, I think she said she felt powerful, but she could never follow through with it. And I think about if she had only followed through and stayed that person, that one that says, I'm not going to take it anymore. If she'd only stayed that person, then maybe things would have been a lot, I know they would have been a lot different for her because she would not put herself in that situation anymore. So I think about all the choices I had too. You know, I don't blame her for not standing up for herself because I didn't do it for many years either. There were times that he was, you know, being bad and I could have stood up as well. But I didn't because I didn't know I could. And that is usually the hardest part is that you don't believe you can or you don't know you can because you're thinking ahead. You're thinking too far ahead. If I do that, then what's going to happen to me when you don't realize that whatever is happening and you're repressing is already happening to you uh, at a deeper level? And, and what I mean is that when you repress the anger, when you repress the fear, when it doesn't get expressed, when you're, when you're not taking action on all that build up inside of you, then it, it turns inward and it develops a, a inward pain and misery inside of you. So instead of making someone else's life, the person who's making you miserable, <laughs> instead of telling them off and making them miserable for a moment, you instead internalize it and make yourself miserable, if that makes any sense. So it's so vital that you start understanding, if you don't already, that when you turn it inward, it's like giving the other people permission to be nasty to you, to be bad to you. And at the same time, sometimes you're faced with things that you don't have a choice. You're in a situation where you don't have a choice but to internalize it, to swallow that anger, to swallow that fear. I mean, there's always a choice that you'll hear people say that, but just for the sake of argument, let's just say that sometimes you don't. Sometimes you're in a situation where if you don't comply, if you show your anger, it might cause a worse situation for a lot of people involved, not just yourself. So I realize there are those moments, but I want you to see those as moments. And for the rest of the time, Start being okay with being angry, but utilizing it in a defensive way. Not an outward, I'm going to punch you in the face way, but in a way that honors you. Because that anger is powerful. It's really good to have. It is the outward expression of what's going on inside of you. And when you express, you let it out of your body, and now you can utilize it. You can utilize almost anything you, that you have inside of you. But anger is a, it's just power. Just think of it as power. It's not bad. It's not evil. And you, you're going to use it to give power to yourself. You get that power back once it comes out of you and you utilize it in a defensive, honoring yourself way. You get that power back. So with that, let's go into the Ask Paul segment and I'll read you an email where someone got angry and we'll see where that goes. Be right back. You know, some people have written to me and told me that they fall asleep to this show. <laughs> I'm never sure if that's a compliment or not, but I always assume it is 
So I guess that's a good thing. So thank you for falling asleep to this show. <laughs> and then I get some letters from people who tell me that they have trouble falling asleep at night. And that is a problem. That definitely needs to be addressed as soon as possible. Sound, restful sleep is something we all need as a foundation for everything we do in our lives. Especially all this personal growth stuff. Some of this healing and growth can take a lot of energy. So being able to lay your body on a mattress with just the right sink and the right bounce helps you get to sleep faster and feel more rested throughout the day. Sleep is so important. It's the body's reset and recharge period. When you get enough sleep, you feel like you can tackle almost anything. But when you don't, you feel like you've been tackled. It's like walking around all day in a pair of shoes that hurt. When your feet are hurting, it's hard to go anywhere or do anything. You'd buy a new pair of shoes in a second just to put that spring back in your step. So I want you to consider how long you've had your mattress and I want you to start putting some comfort and support back into your nightlife. Let me tell you about Casper. They've <laughs> obsessively engineered a mattress not only to make it extremely comfortable and relaxing, but also breathable to help you regulate your temperature throughout the night. What they did is found a way to create the supportive qualities of a memory foam with a springy latex layer so that you won't be too cool or too hot and you get to wake up rested and refreshed without waking up in the middle of the night to turn on the fan. <laughs> this mattress is a serious piece of engineering. They not only offer it for a shockingly fair price, but they let you use it for 100 nights risk-free in your home. And if you don't absolutely love it, they will pick it up for you and refund everything. You don't get this kind of offer anywhere. Go to casper.com forward slash brain. You got to use that promo code brain to get the $50 off and select the size mattress that you want today. And get this, if you're in the US or Canada, the shipping is free. And of course, they'll pick it up for free if you decide that the mattress isn't for you. They back up their claims by letting you use it for over three months. That's a great service from a company that actually wants you to be able to afford a good mattress because they cut the middleman. They send it directly to your home. You don't go to the store and get one of these things. They actually send it in like this mini refrigerator sized box. Delivery person shows up, you open the box and you're ready to go to sleep. <laughs> go to casper.com forward slash brain and get $50 toward your purchase of a mattress today. At least check them out. Casper.com forward slash brain. C-A-S-P-E-R dot com forward slash brain. All right, welcome back. This is the Ask Paul segment. This is where I read a listener email on the air and do my best to help them through a challenge or two. Here's an email I received from someone I'm going to name um, John. This is not really John. I'm just calling him John. And John says, Hi, Paul. I want to let you know how much I enjoy having you as my advocate. As I try to respect my boundaries, I have found that my problem is the way I communicate them. Recently, I had a terrible fight with my father. He's usually on the negative side of things, and I find myself getting angry with him when we talk. He says things like, I have no privacy, or that's too hot, or that's too cold. <laughs> he complains often. I tried talking to him about different things, but the old dynamic of him being dismissive would come back, and that's when my anger would bloom. I didn't think I needed his approval as a father anymore, but Every interaction with him has left me feeling hurt. I tried distancing myself from him, but then he complained through my mother that I was avoiding him. It is more complicated because he is not particularly mean or rude. He's just dismissive. It all came to an end when I tried to talk to him about the problems I'm having in my marriage. I told him that I was at my wit's end with my relationship and I didn't know what else to do as I have been dragging my wife to couples counseling for 10 years without any result. I learned that a big problem is her passive aggression. 
She's not willing to admit her responsibility and put in place anything to cope with her challenges. Nevertheless, my dad says that divorce is not an option. He didn't write it that way. I I emphasized it that way. (laughs) As I'm now trying to separate from my wife, she kept agreeing to certain things only to change her mind later in a true passive-aggressive fashion. I traced the problem to my parents feeding her misinformation, so I confronted them. I did it in a calm way, and I, I explained that divorce is very difficult. It is painful that it wasn't my first choice. But as complicated as things are, telling my wife things that they have heard from friends is not helping. I think I read that right. My dad said that I was crazy and stupid. When I asked him to explain that, he said that he does not talk to crazy or stupid people. Ouch. (laughs) At that point, I lost it. I said things that I hoped would hurt him. For example, I told him, among other things, to get the hell out of the house. I was so enraged that, for the first time, I don't remember what else I said. I normally spend days ruminating after a conflict. This time, I couldn't remember what I said. I kept going back to that moment in my mind and adding what I should have said, which was very strange for me. Paul, I wanted to remain calm during this exchange. How can I avoid anger? It seems that I am quick to get angry with relatives. There's a lot of frustration inside of me. For example, if I had told my dad that it was disappointing that he would choose to put me down at that moment instead of offering advice, that would have been more effective but less satisfying. However, because of my outburst, I lost all credibility. I showed that I am nothing but a spoiled kid that had an outburst. I moved the subject from my emotional hurt to my dad's perception of him being disrespected. It sucked. Anyway, perhaps a theme for your show could be about anger and where to find help. Okay, John, thank you so much for that letter. I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, That sounds like a pickle. (laughs) But you know what? It sounds uh, very relevant to not so much my life anymore, but it used to be my life, and I bet you that someone listening right now can absolutely relate what you're, to what you're talking about because family is the biggest test in personal growth. Family is where, that, that is your testing ground. When you think you've learned, grown, evolved, and healed or whatever, then you go to your family and you figure out if that's really true. How do you do that? You find the most dysfunctional person in your family that triggered you the most and you go, okay, I've got all these boundaries. I'm ready to honor them. Let's go talk to dad. <laughs> and I've told that story where I, I had an opportunity to honor myself, honor my mom, where my stepfather showed up at the front door. And I, and I said, all right, I'm going to honor myself at this moment. And I'm not going to let him in because they had separated and he wasn't welcome in that home anymore. And I did it. And it worked. And it was hard. It was one of the hardest decisions and action steps that I've ever taken to honor my boundaries. But, uh, you know, one small step leads to another. And I had taken many small steps in honoring myself before that moment. Now, what's funny is that my, my biological father, who has passed on many years ago, um, I hadn't talked to him for many, many years. So I got an opportunity to experience him after a 10-year break from each other. In other words, uh, the last time I talked to him, I was, uh, what was I, 32, I think, and or 33, something, something, sometime around there. And then the next time I talked to him, I was 43. And if you've been listening to my show, I had my breakdown at, at like 35, my midlife crisis, whatever you want to call it. I was the, uh, the pinnacle of my depression and also the start of my healing and growth or at least a lot of it. And when that happened, um, I transformed and I've been transforming and I continue to transform into a person that is always evolving in some way, at least I hope (laughs) in many ways, getting to a point where I feel better about almost everything. You know, that's a process. 
if you're not there yet, don't worry because it, it, it's a process. It, it'll take a while and it may take the rest of your life. But as long as you're always on that forward momentum, that forward progression, then you're on the right path. It's always forward momentum until it's not. For example, like you said, when you lost it, <laughs> that may not be forward momentum, but it doesn't mean it's a big step backwards either. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, what I want to tell you about my dad and my biological father is that when I finally went to visit him again, which uh, he was basically on his deathbed. So 10 years had passed and I had been contemplating going to patch things up with him. You know, I finally turned into the man that I felt comfortable being, whatever that means. But I, you know, I went through all this personal growth and healing and uh, I was ready to talk to him again. And I never really talk about my father, my, my biological father too much on this show. Um, he wasn't too much of a source of dysfunction in my life, but we had our moments and we, and I'll probably share things about him later on. But uh, for the most part, you know, I got along with my father and Until he started asking for money and he was treating me like the father instead of me like the son. It was just an odd mix. I didn't like it. So I I kind of moved away from him, you know, emotionally and and physically I'd already been away from him. But emotionally I didn't want to stay connected to him because he was draining me. So 10 years went by and then my younger brother calls me out of the blue and, and says, dad's in the hospital. And then I thought, all right, then I've been thinking about it. I've been contemplating it. This is the time I'm ready to face myself again. Cause that's who you're really facing with in any situation. You are facing yourself and who you used to be and who you want to be or who you believe you are now. Do you want to face yourself? Are you ready to face yourself by going back into a relationship that may not have served you in any way or them. I mean, being in a dysfunctional relationship that doesn't serve either of you. You know, he may have been getting needs met by me, but that didn't really serve him. That didn't empower him if I was enabling his needs. So we took that break or I made it happen and uh, it gave me time to heal from that. So here I am going back 10 years later and visiting him in the hospital and it was great. It was a, a great reunion because, like I said, I'm a man now. I'm, I'm grown up, or at least I felt grown up. At 33, I didn't feel grown up. At 43, I felt a little bit more grown up. And I had done a lot of healing. So I was ready to figure out who I was. I was re- ready to face myself. How am I going to respond? Who am I going to be? Is he going to ask for money? <laughs> and if he does, what will I say? And I was ready and he didn't ask for money and it didn't matter if he did or not because I was ready to just say, no, let's not make this about money. Let's make this about rekindling. Let's make this about our relationship. Let's make this something that doesn't create an awkward moment, but he never asked. So it was all good. And, uh, but I did get to see him in the hospital and who he really was this whole time I knew him. Now, this is the interesting part, is that because I took a break from him for 10 years and I changed, it gave him a chance to change as well, if he wanted to, if he was on that path. And what I noticed is that he didn't change at all, for the most part. I mean, like I said, he wasn't asking for money or anything like that. And for the most part, we got along great. But there's something I noticed about him this time but I, that I never did before. Because this is what happens when you're around someone all the time. You don't notice their nuances. You don't notice the things that might bother you if you didn't know them, if they were a stranger to you and you just met and you were getting to know them for the first time. This is what happened when I revisited my dad 10 years after not seeing him, is that I got to know him again from a different place inside of me. And what that did was allow me to see him differently for the first time. And I got to tell you, like your father, my father complained a lot. (laughs) And uh, it it gave me a, a wonderful opportunity to figure out where some of my pessimism 
came from throughout life. Because I, was, I used to be a combination of pessimistic and optimistic. I was mostly optimistic all the time, but I found myself criticizing a lot. I found myself being very judgmental. I don't know if it came directly from him, but noticing these qualities in my father, noticing these characteristics in my father uh, for the first time ever, I was like, whoa, I lived with this guy. This, this person was shaping who I was and who I am today. This person was my main influence for many years. And I'm thinking, did he just get old and crotchety? Or was he always this way? And I had to think back and I go, oh my God, he was always this way. This is the way he's been for as long as I've known him. But I never realized it until now. So this was a huge revelation for me because I had not seen my father in this light ever. And it gave me an opportunity to figure out uh, where some of my qualities, where some of my character flaws and characteristics came from and some of the mannerisms that I have. And it gave me an opportunity to explore that in myself quite a bit, which is what happens when you revisit relatives after a long time is that you get to revisit yourself. Who am I going to be? Am I going to be the same person that they always knew? Or am I going to be this new person that I know? And who am I going to fall back on? The new me or the old me? The, the person I am today or the person they still believe I am? It's a choice who you become in that moment. And if you really believe you're evolved, that's when you open the door to family and go, Hey, here I am. Test me. <laughs> and uh, for you, John. To reach a point of anger where you, quote, lose it. Then you get so angry that you don't remember what you said. That is losing it. That is going outside of conscious control of your actions. And it is a very offensive anger. Not like you're being offensive, but like in a sport. You're being offensive. You're, you're attacking. You're pushing your anger outward towards someone else instead of using it to defend yourself in a productive way. It's just like I talked about in the last segment. You got to a point where you were so triggered that you pushed your anger outward towards him. And then you said many things that you may regret. But I've talked about this before. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's good to know that you have a tipping point because this helps you measure how far you can be pushed. It also shows that you have strength and power in you. It also shows that you have a lot more resources that you can draw from that will help you if you need it. It's like a person trapped under a car in, an, in a car accident. One or two people might be able to lift that car off because they have it within them. Now, going up to a car and just lifting it may not be what they would do normally, but when their adrenaline is flowing through their body and they are supercharged from anger or fear or just compassion beyond belief, then maybe they can lift that car off that person and the person can, can get out. There are stories like that where your adrenaline kicks in and suddenly you're just a different person. You just, you're going to do it no matter what. You're going to run into that burning building and save that person no matter what, whereas you wouldn't do that normally if there wasn't a person inside. You might not even, you might not even say, I, I would do it for $10,000 or a million dollars. You might not do that. But if there's a person inside, something triggers or switches inside of you, and you do it. This is inside of us all. This is when you can utilize what we call the negative feelings, anger and fear especially. I mean, some of this stuff doesn't feel powerful. When we're in fear, it doesn't feel powerful. But it can be utilized because you can turn it into something powerful. And where you went was externalizing it and pushing it outward instead of utilizing it and using it for yourself. So you gave away your power is what, <laughs> and maybe you feel that way. You gave away your power. So now that you know your tipping point, because I, I do believe it's healthy to experience losing it. Now that you know that point where you snap, then you know what it takes for it to happen. 
Because next time you're going to feel it bubbling up inside of you. So I don't want you to regret that you lost it. I want you to take it as a learning experience that was very helpful so that you know at what point the strength comes. And and that's how I want you to see it as strength, confidence, power, superpowers, <laughs> abilities you didn't know you had. Because the next time it happens, which it probably will, you may be able to choose to not lose it and instead honor yourself. And what does that mean? You stand up for yourself as if you were your own protector. It's kind of like that movie, what's it called? Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze. He was like a bodyguard that went to different bars and clubs all over the country. And he knew how to fight, but he also knew how to communicate with people. And one of the things he said is, and I'm paraphrasing here, it's not time to fight until it's time to fight. I know I really screwed that up, but he just said, just be nice. Just be nice until it's time to fight and you'll know when it's time to fight. And there's an interesting perspective, (laughs) but I really enjoyed it because he approaches situations um, in a way where you're just honoring the establishment. You're honoring yourself. You're being nice and you're not letting anyone beat you up. But at the same time, you're just being nice. You be nice until it's time to not be nice. I think that's the quote, actually. Be nice until it's time to not be nice. And then you have to do what you have to do. So I know that's easier said than done because usually when you get triggered and you lose it, it's a very unconscious thing. But before you go unconscious, it is a choice. It is a choice and I'm planting this seed inside your head right now To know that it's a choice because as it bubbles up inside of you, you can say, am I going to honor myself or am I going to be angry at that person? And if you make the choice to honor yourself, it's a whole lot more productive and you have a whole lot more control of what comes out of you because now you're speaking from a place of power because the power is contained within you. You're utilizing it. When you let it go and push it all outward, then it's released. And it all goes towards someone else and they feel hurt and then you regret what you said and or you forget what you said and then time and then you have to wait for time to heal things if it heals at all. But I'm not saying that even when you defend yourself that it's not going to hurt either for other people because some people don't want you to change. Some people don't want you to honor yourself. They would rather you honor them not honoring you, which is a terrible, <laughs> terrible place to be. If they are not honoring you, honoring yourself, that's a problem and you can't have these toxic people in your life. But if you honor yourself, then at least you're coming from a place of integrity within. And not that it's not a place of integrity when you attack or be offensive, but at least least all the power, if I may use that term, is contained within and utilized for yourself to use as you see fit. If that makes any sense. So there's, there's the first part of that. Don't worry that you lost it. Just use it as a gauge for you so that the next time that you start to feel yourself getting angry, that you remember that you have a choice at this moment. And it's all in the philosophy of how you live your life. If you want to push outward and attack, then that philosophy may work against you more often than not. But if you have a philosophy of how can I honor myself best, in this situation, then you're going to learn to say the right things because you may not know upfront what to say. But if you saw yourself as being attacked in any way and you have a choice of attacking back or going, whoa, stand back, you're attacking me and I don't appreciate it. I mean, that's a very defensive stance. I remember my girlfriend got me upset once. I think I've only done this like once or twice in our relationship where she was on a roll. She was saying something (laughs) and she was going on and on and on. And I looked at her and I said, stop. And she started to say something else. I was like, stop. (laughs) And she goes, she didn't know what to say. I was like, stop. You're attacking me and I don't appreciate it. I took all this energy that I had that was building up and I defended myself. I feel disrespected you're crossing the line. Some of the things that you're saying, you're just painting this picture that doesn't really exist. So stop. 
And then she started to say something else. And I, and I said, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> and then she relaxed and I relaxed. And then we had a productive conversation. And it, it doesn't really matter if she was right and I was wrong or I was right and she was wrong. I didn't make that part uh, prevalent. I just wanted to communicate with her more effectively. And when she uh, calmed down and I calmed down, then it was more effective. And one of the things that came out of that is that I'm one of the few, I don't know, if not the first people in her life to not be bowled over by her, to not be a pushover, to not be a what she called a doormat. She goes, I'm glad you're not a doormat and that you actually speak up for yourself, which surprised me because I thought she was just going to be upset that I spoke up for myself. But it was nice to f have that feeling of not being a doormat. I used to be that doormat. So uh, the way I used to be wouldn't work for her in this relationship. So the fact that I can stand up and say something if I don't agree with something makes me feel good. It makes me feel powerful. It makes me feel alive, for lack of a better term. With family, if you've been a doormat for all this time and you want to change that, that's when you make that choice. How am I going to do this? Am I going to attack or am I going to come from within and have this power and keep it and utilize it for me? So again, that's the first comment I want to make on the email. There's a few more things to talk about here. So stick around and we'll be right back. All right, we're back. Thanks for continuing to tune into the show. And uh, we're talking about John's email here. And uh, one of the things that John says is that his father complains a lot. And I mentioned last segment that my father complained a lot. And I didn't even know it until you know, about a month before his death that, wow, this guy's a complainer. And, uh, you know, when you deal with a complainer, there's not much you can do to change them. I mean, sure, there are probably influential, manipulative ways that you can uh, change someone else. But if they don't want to change, you probably are wasting your time. So what does that mean? That means, John, and anyone else listening, that if you know a complainer, accept that they will never change. Accept that they will never be a different person. They will never become the person that you want them to be. Accept that they will always complain about everything. That doesn't mean you have to like it. It just means now that you know who they are and what they'll say about everything. So when you want to impress them with something, they won't be impressed. When you want to show them something that you did that you're proud of, they won't be proud. When you want to prove to them that you're right and they're wrong, they will find a way to prove you wrong or make it wrong or something. These are all realizations you have to have with a chronic complainer. You have to have them. Otherwise, you'll go nuts. <laughs> you will suffer. Why doesn't dad like when I do this? Nothing I do is ever good enough. It's true. Nothing you do will ever be good enough for a chronic complainer. That's too bad. It's just the way it is. He grew up probably with his dad or someone else complaining as well. So he learned how to complain. And if someone in your family is a chronic complainer and you've hung out with them uh, day after day, year after year, you probably have some of them in you as well. And if you don't, then you probably have the complete opposite where you won't complain about anything. And what's funny about that is that I believed I was that person for a long time. I hung out with my dad all the time, yet I didn't think I was a complainer. I didn't think he was a complainer. And I remember being at a concert once with my girlfriend of 13 years, um, many years ago. And after the concert, I was like, you know, he used to be a lot better, but now he just sounds light and he's not that rock person that I remember him being. And my girlfriend was like, oh, I loved it. And I was like, yeah, but uh, he, he just didn't sound like, you know, powerful like he used to sound. And I don't know what it is. Well, 
I enjoyed it. Why did you have to ruin the moment for me? And I was like, what? And I had to listen to myself and go, I don't, I don't know how it came about, but I was thinking, do I say this often? Do I complain a lot? She might've even said that. Why do you, why do you always have to complain about things? And I was thinking, I, I complain about things. She goes, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. I was like, what do you mean? I'm always nice. I always say nice things. This is just one of those moments. And I had to really consider, is this one of those moments or is this often? Do I do this a lot? So, you know, it was a realization in me. And, and if you have lived with a complainer for a long time, you may find it in you too. And so you have to ask yourself, am I the same way in any way, shape or form? Am I highly critical? Am I highly judgmental about things? Am, am I picking things apart? You know, you, you ask yourself the questions to figure out if you are that type of person too. You may not be, but if you are, that gives you some idea of where they're coming from and maybe how people see you as well. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean you can be more empathetic with your father? Maybe, or maybe not, but at least you can understand that uh, where he gets it is probably from someone else as well. All this stuff is passed down. I don't mean genetically, but it's possible. <laughs> There's genetic predisposition that I'm sure might happen in uh, characteristics in each other and the mannerisms in us, but it's also passed down through nurturing and conditioning and you know who we live with, we are molded by. I even find myself doing hand gestures that I remember my, my dad specifically doing. I find myself doing it and go, whoa, I feel like my dad. <laughs> it's really strange. But yeah, there are, there are characteristics that we have of our parents or our caretakers when we were growing up that we pick up. So it's good to know that, you know, sometimes the things we see in other people, we also have ourselves. Sometimes the things we don't like in other people are things that we may not like about ourselves. We may not even know about these things in ourselves. This is one of those things where it still comes back to us, where you don't like something about someone and then you go, okay, how does that show up in me? I remember when I worked with a guy that told the worst jokes, <laughs> they were awful. And uh, I would go home and tell my wife when I was married that this guy, I can't stand working with him. He just tells these bad jokes and then I have to laugh politely. And, you know, back then I didn't have boundaries where I could go, your jokes aren't funny. I'm not going to laugh. <laughs> I may not even say that today just to be polite. I don't know. But I would go home and say, God, I just can't stand this guy. He just keeps, keeps making bad jokes. And she closed her eyes and started cracking up. And I was like, what are you laughing at? And she goes, that's exactly what you do. <laughs> and I was like, what? That's not what I do. I don't make bad jokes. She goes, you do all the time. She goes, I laugh at some and I don't laugh at others. <laughs> And I had to stop and think about it and go, what? this is not right. And I had a realization. My realization is that, oh, I am unconscious of a lot of the things that I do. And when I am conscious of other people's behavior and it bothers me, it's probably something that I'm unconscious about in myself. And that was a big realization for me. Like, what? The, the things that bother me and other people are somehow within me too. Otherwise, they wouldn't bother me. That doesn't make any sense because there are some people who do evil things. And, you know, of course, not everything in someone else is going to be in you. But typically, the nuances, typically the subtle things that bother you about other people are things that are really inside you in some way, shape, or form. They show up in you in some way, shape, or form. Not always, but when you have that idea, then you can explore it in yourself. So the thing he did, told bad jokes, made me realize that I tell jokes all the time and I think they're funny. <laughs> I don't tell jokes all the time, but when I do, I think they're funny. And some people don't laugh. And I try to be dry about it and not laugh at my own jokes 
just to make sure if they don't get it that uh, uh, they think that it's not a joke. But that doesn't always work either. That sometimes backfires. <laughs> but, you know, that really made clear to me that, oh, so what's in him is also in me. And what bothers me about that is something that I'm unconscious of in myself. It's something that I haven't learned to accept about myself or come to terms with in myself. And when I figured that out, I realized that, okay, I also tell bad jokes too. And what that did was allow me to be more compassionate toward him because I saw a piece of me in him. That's a good way to look at it, isn't it? What in me is in him or what in him is in me or her? What in that person is in me? And once you figure that out, then your heart opens up just a little bit, maybe, or more, and you're able to kind of see the world from their perspective, or at least have some compassion for what they might have experienced to become the person they are today. That gives you some uh, inside knowledge for their, uh, the behavior that they have today. So it's helpful. It, it, it's just helpful. So let's move on with your letter and, and see where else we can go with this. One of the things that you said is, I didn't think I needed his approval as a father anymore, but every interaction with him has, help, has left me feeling hurt. Well, you're right. You don't need his approval, but typically when we look for approval, it's because we didn't get it when we were younger. When we were younger, if we were approved or paid attention to more often than not, then we're not seeking that attention later on in life. But you figured something out about yourself. You're still looking for that approval. Why? Why are you still looking for approval from someone who is incapable of giving it? That seems futile. You may not have had this realization until now, but think about it now. Think about trying to squeeze blood from a stone, if I may use that analogy. I'm trying to squeeze this stone and I know I'm going to get blood out of it. That's, that's just a saying that I heard a long time ago if you're not familiar with it. How can you squeeze blood from a stone? You can't. You can't get the qualities or characteristics that you want out of people that are incapable of doing it or haven't learned how to do it yet. It's impossible. And even if it is possible, just assume that it's impossible. You will never get his approval. Now, that sounds hard. It sounds cold. It may even hurt to hear that. I know, it, w it probably does hurt to know that you can't get your father's approval. God, that hurts. But then you think, okay, why am I trying to get his approval? Well, you know, that comes from childhood. When you're a kid, you're always saying, Dad, Mom, look at this, look at this, look what I did. You're always trying to impress. You're always trying to get that attention from your parents. Whether they couldn't do it in ways that you needed, were incapable of doing it, didn't want to do it, all these things come up. Look at what I did. You're trying to impress them because you want to feel safe and secure and loved and, and, want, and know that you're wanted. And some people are incapable of doing that. They create children and then they don't want them. What is that about? And, and that hurts. It's a real life thing that happens to a lot of people. I remember being told that I was the only planned pregnancy for my mom and dad. My dad told me this. And then I asked my mom years later and she's like, you weren't planned. You were a mistake. <laughs> now, I was in a place in life where that didn't hurt at all. I just thought it was funny because I'm here now and I'm ha I have my own life and I love my mom and I love my dad. So it didn't matter. I didn't care if my dad thought it was planned. Maybe he planned it, but she didn't. <laughs> but that's okay with me. I don't mind that I'm a mistake because I'm still here. I made it. And now I have a life and I'm doing my own thing. So even if they didn't plan it, because now that I'm a, an adult, I realize that can happen. You may not be able to plan for a child that you have. Sometimes it's a surprise. And then sometimes you're trying and trying and trying and it never happens. And then you stop trying and then it happens. It just happens that way. So my point is when you look at how, for example, John, your father 
treated you when you were a child. And maybe he was incapable of giving you the love and attention that you deserved. And this is the important part. You deserved love and attention. And sometimes you don't get it, not because you don't deserve it, but because the people around you are are incapable of giving it to you. And that is an important differentiator that I want you to get through your head. It doesn't mean it's going to change history. What you have to realize is that you are absolutely worthy of love and attention. You are absolutely worthy of everything that you desire. Even what might be seen as a simple hug or a simple smile, you're worthy of it. So I don't want you to think that when your father is incapable of giving it to you doesn't mean that you're not worthy. One doesn't equal the other. It just means that he can't do it for you. So how do you do it? You do it for yourself. You give yourself the love and attention that a father should give their child. If you do not have a father that does that for you, you have to do it yourself. I know that just sounds so (laughs) wishy-washy. <laughs> How do I do it myself? Well, I've gone through this process before and I'm, I'm not going to go through the whole thing here and now, but I do have a process that I teach my coaching clients, which I'll tell you in this 15 second brief uh, walkthrough, which is going inside your mind and visiting yourself as a child and becoming your own dad. You're not exactly becoming your own dad, but you're visiting yourself and giving yourself what you needed so much as a child. Whether that's a love, whether that's a pat on the back, you know, whatever it is for you. Like I said, I walk through that with my coaching clients directly, but um, it's also in, and I don't mean to turn this into a sales ad or anything, but it's also in the patron program where you can actually download the audio. And I created a 15 minute audio that actually walks you through this process of visiting yourself as the adult you are now, uh, going into your childhood and giving yourself what you needed. Because sometimes that's the only way to do it. Sometimes you don't have people in your life that can give you what you deserve. That show you that you are worthy. That you are lovable. Because you are. But God, there's so many people that are incapable of doing that. So certainly if you still have uh, an issue trying to find that worthiness in you, you know, reach out to me. We can coach or join the patron program and you can download that particular audio to help you through it. But I think that's really going to help you as far as um, finding that love and attention that you deserve because you are worthy. And just because people in your life couldn't make you realize that, it's still true. It doesn't matter if someone else couldn't give you that love and attention. You still are worthy of it. You still deserve it. And I know it's true, so it must be true. How about that? We'll be right back and we'll uh, finish this email and then we'll close the show. Back in a minute. All right, in the last segment, I mentioned the TOB patron program. Let me just give you a brief rundown of what that is. It is a private website where you can go and listen to episodes of The Overwhelmed Brain that you've never heard. (laughs) They're not full episodes. They're just kind of one-offs, anywhere from 5 minutes to 30 minutes long, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. But it gives me an opportunity to share some knowledge that I don't particularly share on this show. Uh, For example, today I got to share some information on the NLP eye patterns that I learned many, many years ago. And it's how people use their eyes when they're thinking of things, when they're thinking of pictures or sounds or feelings and or logic or self-talk. And our eyes move in different ways for different reasons when we're thinking. I mean, you've seen people do this on TV where, let me think about that. And then they look up. I'm thinking, well, why do they look up? You may not care, I don't know. (laughs) But I I decided to create a a mini episode on it. It's about 20 minutes long for the patrons in the program. So if you're a member, you're going to get that probably on Friday, which is uh, June 3rd, 2016. So if you're listening to this years from now, 
That's the Friday I mean. <laughs> Here's a little clip from that segment to give you an idea of what we offer over in the patron program. I hope you enjoy it. I'll be right back. When you construct something auditorily, you're making up the sound in your head. Now, a good example of that is imagine what your car would sound like if when you turned the key, it sounded like a duck. <laughs> and now imagine what it would sound like if your dog or cat or whatever animal that you have opened its mouth and spoke Spanish. This is the kind of stuff that we can construct in our mind, and it's fully possible. Our brain is amazing. We can create new sounds in our head. We can think of an animal opening its mouth and speaking Spanish. What would that sound like in that animal's voice? <laughs> Those are the kinds of sounds that you can create. And, you know, sometimes that's how musicians think. They think in sounds, and how can I create a new sound? What would it sound like if I did this? And they're always accessing the the auditory processing of their brain. So that's what the eyes do. They go left and right, accessing the auditory processes, either creating or constructing a sound or remembering a sound. Like, do you remember the sound of your first girlfriend or boyfriend? All right, that was a little clip from the TLB patron program. And all that program is, is you pay anywhere from $3 and up per month to listen to private episodes that I put out there. They're not the regular overwhelmed brain fully produced episodes. Uh, someday I might be in my car and just produce a little show. I did that last week when it was raining and it was kind of fun, <laughs> like sound effects in the background. And then someday I might have some information that I want to share that I really don't want to put into the regular show because it doesn't fit the theme or the topic of the week. But in the TOB patron membership site, I can certainly put in anything that's requested or anything that I think of as far as mini workshops or just a um, particular subject matter that uh, people are going through. And I've got other things planned like um, mini coaching sessions with people on some of the processes that I talk about on this show. Like uh, I have a plan to do a mini episode on the drill down process, on trying to figure out what's underneath that emotion and what's underneath that thought and how much farther can we go down this until we find what is creating some of the misery in your life or some of the pain in your life or whatever you're holding on to when you use what I call the drill down process you get to figure out what originated any pain or negative feeling that you may have been carrying around for many years so go to the overwhelmedbrain.com forward slash member not only do we have private episodes but you can also get priority email support from me you can get the uh, worksheets and the ebooks for free and if you're on the highest level, you can also do live workshops and uh, group video coaching with me and other coaches as well. So I really hope to see you over there. The resources are getting more and more, and I'm getting a lot of good feedback. So I hope to see you there. TheOverwhelmedBrain.com forward slash member. All right, let's finish up this email from John. John, you've said a lot here, so uh, it's hard to address everything that you're asking about, but I do want to definitely comment on a few things, especially uh, one of the things that really stood out is that you said you're dragging your wife to couples counseling for 10 years without any result. You have to set a deadline for this kind of stuff. This is not healthy to continue going with no results. And if you're serious, you've gotten no results from it, then how much longer will you do this and not have any results? And if you don't have results, the next question is, are you happy more often than not? Because if you are, then, you know, maybe counseling is kind of like a, um, a boost. But if you're less happy more often and this couple's counseling has not given you any results, then this is a problem. This is when you look at your calendar and go, you know what? If there's no results at this point, then we just have to stop. In my personal opinion, 10 years is way too long. I don't think you should go. I, I think a few months, you should know where you are in counseling. Even a few weeks with some counselors that are really good, you should know where you're heading. Is it heading in a good direction? But just 10 years is just too long. This is when it's so important to create 
a date of absolution <laughs> or a date where you go, okay, if things don't change by this time, we need to do something different. Whether that's stop counseling and, and do something radically different or take the next step, which is, you know, maybe you're happier on your own. I don't know. I don't know your situation completely. So I wanted to comment on that because it's important that you don't drag these things out for years. You must find closure as soon as possible. It's torture <laughs> to continue going in this direction for years and years and years. When I was married, uh, I was married for a total of four and a half years. And I thought it was going to get better every year. But you know what? Week after week, I would get triggered and we'd have bad moments. And we had a good mix of good and bad moments. But year after year, what I thought was a steady incline in progress was really a steady decline in everything else. So you really have to be honest with yourself and figure out, is this getting better? Is this getting worse? Is this changing at all? And are we going in the right direction? And sometimes you just have to take a step back out of the relationship and look at it from an outsider's perspective and go, whoa, so did you feel this same way last year? And did you feel the same way before that? Has any progress been made? And if the answer is no, then it's time to find closure. It's time to look at your calendar and set a date and go, if nothing changes by this date, we need to do something different. Now, you do mention that you are trying to separate from your wife. And you say that she keeps agreeing to certain things only to change her mind later in a true passive-aggressive fashion. And then you say, I traced the problem back to my parents feeding her misinformation. So that's when you confronted them. Let me make it clear that regardless of her behavior, you are in charge of your behavior. So if you really are trying to separate, then you do it. If that's what you want for you, then you do it. I don't promote divorce here unless it's abusive or toxic. But sometimes you have to listen to yourself and go, geez, you know, I've been trying and trying and trying and it doesn't work. So I need to get out of here. So you make the choice. You take a stand. You take action. And you do what you need for, for you. And if she's doing anything passive aggressive, it shouldn't matter. Because what do you want for you? You know, I talked with a coaching client recently that said, yeah, but my partner says things and keeps stringing me along. Like there might be a chance to save this relationship. Again, set a deadline. Because if that chance comes and goes by that deadline, then you can take action. Because indecisive people will usually always stay indecisive. And indecisive people also like to string you along. So they can stay comfortable being where they are. They can keep you where they are and it makes them feel comfortable. It keeps them in their dysfunction. So if you want to separate, do it. Take action. And then if she has anything to say and you do want to get back together, at least you're doing it from a place of action that you already took instead of action that you're contemplating taking. Because contemplation and anticipation and waiting for things to happen usually don't happen in situations like this. You have to make them happen. So I would give practical advice there and say, just do what you want to do or it's going to continue dragging on, maybe for another 10 years. And you don't want that. Now, let me get to your main question, which you uh, said so clearly at the end, which is, Paul, I wanted to remain calm during this exchange you're talking about with your father when you lost it and you got so angry that you don't even remember what you said. How can I avoid anger? It seems that I am quick to get angry with relatives. There's a lot of frustration inside me. All right, it's so important that you understand who you're dealing with before you get angry. Because if you get angry at people doing behavior that they always do anyway, then it's wasted energy. Think about this. If you know someone's going to behave the way they always behave, or even if you don't know, you just have to assume that they're going to behave the way they always behave. Like the chronic complainer is always going to be a chronic complainer. The person who doesn't support you will never support you. You'll never get it. So what you need to do is understand that that's the way it is. That's the way they will always be. 
no matter what kind of attention or love or support that you're looking for from people like that, you won't get it. You can't because they're incapable of giving it. So how do you remain calm? Step one, know that you have a choice to be anger defensive, to be honoring yourself and not pushing that energy outward towards someone else. Step two, know who they are. Know who you're dealing with. If the person's a chronic complainer, then I guarantee anything you say they're going to complain about. If the person is not notorious for supporting you, then I guarantee they're not going to support you no matter what you say. So there's step one and step two. Step three is something I actually mentioned earlier, which is drill down into your emotions and figure out what you're really angry about. Because anger is never about the moment. Anger is always about something that happened to you in the past. I mean, before the moment, like long time before, typically in childhood. Because when you learned to get angry, that's how you learned to be angry in moments uh, like this. And this anger sometimes is directed inward toward yourself. If you're looking for the support, the love, the attention from a family member, and they're incapable of giving it, maybe you get mad at yourself for even looking in that direction. Like you're mad at them for not being able to do it, and then you're mad at yourself in some deeper way, or for being naive or gullible enough to think that it would work, or that you'd get that from them, with all due respect. I mean, many of us spend a lot of our life trying to fulfill what we didn't get as children. If we didn't get love, we're looking for love. If we didn't get attention, we're looking for attention. And these things come out in us in, as we grow up in our work, in our relationships, in our personality. I call those dysfunctions. Whatever was not functioning as a child becomes a dysfunction as an adult. So when you get into an abusive relationship, it's because you're looking for the love of an abusive person because you were brought up by an abusive person. So it's important to figure out what you think you're missing in your family. When you go to your family, what do you think you're missing? Do you think you never got nurtured enough? Are you looking for the admiration, the attention, the support from your dad or from your mom? I mean, it, it could be true and that's okay. But try to figure out inside of you what you didn't get as a kid and what you're trying to get now. Because I want you to realize there's some futility there of trying to, like I said, squeeze that blood from a stone, trying to make them someone that they can't be. And as hard as that is to hear, because I think uh, it's ingrained in us to want to be wanted, to want to be loved that by the people that brought us up, sometimes we just have to realize that they don't have it in them. So what do you do? You develop self-compassion. You go, if I were my dad, myself, what would I do for me? What would I need? If I were my mom, what would I like to have from her? And then provide it to yourself. That's self-compassion. When you have compassion for others who don't have compassion for you, that's where you start getting in trouble. I mean, I think it's healthy to have compassion for everyone. But when you're overly compassionate to people or you're kinder to people who aren't kind back, or you're honoring people who don't honor you, when there's only a give but rarely a receive, that's when the problems start. That's when you can look at your life and go, okay, there is a deficit. There is toxicity. How do I avoid deficit? How, I, how do I avoid toxicity? There are some people that believe that family is everything no matter what we should all get along and even if we don't get along we should all get together for the family reunions <laughs> I'm not a big believer in that I love my family there are certain members of my family that I don't necessarily care about there are certain members of my family that I've never met that I'd like to meet and there are certain members of my family that I would love to be around more often but they're people they have their own lives, their own battles, their own healing to do. So I realize that sometimes they won't be in a place to be able to love me the way I want or the way I need. So I have to come to an acceptance with that. 
in doing that is a it's a very practical step to take but how do you get beyond the hurt that you feel from family it's like i said self compassion is where you start and it's a process it's a process of healing you have to figure out what am i hurting from in my childhood what do i feel like i'm missing from my childhood and you need to start fulfilling that in in small ways i have a few episodes on this so i'm not going to go through the processes now but certainly you can reach out to me for coaching if you want direct guidance on this or just search for episodes where i talk about healing from emotional pain from your past that's a huge thing and that's like a major step forward once once you get into that place of healing from something that happened a long time ago because like i said anger fear all this stuff that comes up in us in the moment isn't about the moment we get triggered in the moment but it isn't about the moment now finally you said because of your outburst that you lost credibility you said i showed that i'm nothing but a spoiled kid that had an outburst i don't have a problem with outbursts <laughs> unless you do it often when you do it often you become what some people call a drama queen <laughs> or in your case maybe a drama king i don't know but outbursts are the point where you can't take anymore you reach that point and i can't take it anymore and now you f- are almost going unconscious and you're flailing your arms and you're screaming and you're saying things that you probably don't mean and i just had another client recently where i talked about how the words we say aren't necessarily what we mean but they are a transformation of the inner negative energy inside of us coming out verbally and sometimes it comes out in words that we don't mean to say and you just can't help it sometimes because it's a streaming subconscious all these thoughts are coming out in a stream of words but they're just words they have very little meaning except to release inner energy that's built up inside of us they just come out blah <laughs> that's why i chose to stop losing it because every time i lost it i i sounded like an idiot <laughs> i would i would get in arguments with uh, my girlfriend back in the day and uh, i would say things and lose every argument because i went so subconscious and it, i was so frustrated like you and so how do you get beyond that how do you stay calm during angry situations how do you get past this frustration i'll say this in closing you have to start honoring yourself you have to start honoring your boundaries because as you start doing that you'll realize what boundaries are being crossed i mean that's really all it is once you realize what boundaries are being crossed because you're starting to honor them which means you're starting to expose them in your life and you're starting to tell others what they are people get a clear message from you oh that's your boundary and then you go yes that's my boundary wouldn't use that language typically but they would see it they would go oh so if i say this to you you get angry yes so don't say that to me all right i'm going to say that to you then i'll get angry <laughs> but it's a choice you can choose to get angry or you can choose to walk away and say you know what this person's never going to change they know my boundaries they violate them anyway so i'm going to get the hell out of here i don't need to deal with this because this person doesn't want to honor and respect me you need to start respecting yourself first honor your boundaries so you know what they are and if you have to discover what they are just look at everything that triggers you <laughs> then you can start honoring them in the in the way when somebody says something you don't like or does something you don't like you can speak up or you can get out of that situation so when you get to a place in yourself that you see something or you hear something or something rubs you the wrong way and you ask yourself the question is this right is this right for me then you can learn to stand up and go no this is not right and i'm going to come at this uh, from a defensive honoring standpoint and make sure that this doesn't cross my boundaries and if they still try to do it i walk away developing a calmness when you want to be angry is a, a step by step process but it doesn't happen overnight you do have to practice this little by little you have to practice saying no when you really mean no and yes when you really mean yes you have to practice being honest with yourself and what you want for yourself because if you don't show people what you want they make assumptions 
And if you don't show people what your boundaries are, then they will continue crossing them. And if they do know what your boundaries are, and they continue crossing them, and you stay in the situation where your boundaries are being crossed, then whose fault is that? I won't answer that question. (laughs) I'll let you sit with that and everything else I've said in the episode. I hope this has helped. We talked about quite a bit today and certainly reach out, like I said, if you uh, have any more questions or you want to explore this further, I'm happy to help. Thank you so much, John, for the writing of the letter. Thank you for sharing this. I hope things are going well for you and send me an update sometime. And thanks for tuning in to this episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I am always honored when you do that and when you hang around past that precious one hour point going, why is this show still playing past an hour? (laughs) I like long shows. I don't know about you, but I so appreciate you tuning in and uh, we're going to end the show now and uh, we'll be right back. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to thank our sponsor, Casper.com. That's C-A-S-P-E-R.com. And if you want the $50 off the mattress, go to Casper.com forward slash brain. Check them out. They're supporting the show, so go ahead and support them. And it helps everyone out, and you'll get a fantastic mattress at a fantastic price. Casper.com forward slash brain. I also want to thank you for listening to the patron segment that I put in the middle of the show. For $3 a month, you can get the private episodes. And for $7 a month, you can get the worksheets and the ebooks. And it goes up from there, but you have your choice. And it's only just a few dollars a month. Well worth it. And I get to connect with you more often. So I hope to see you over there. Go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash member. And maybe we'll connect on the inside. And whether you're a patron or not, I want to thank you if you've purchased any of my books or worksheets or especially used the Amazon link on the website at theoverwhelmedbrain.com. The Amazon link is the easiest way to give back, so if you've been listening for months or even years, use that Amazon link every time you shop. Your shopping habits make a huge difference, so definitely go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com and click on the Amazon link to shop, or just drag that Amazon link to your desktop and use it every time, and share it with all your friends, and so on and so on. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and finally, thank you to Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in The Overwhelmed Brain. And I want to take a moment to thank the people who actually filled out the survey I sent to the email list. There was a question I asked, and the question was, how do you feel most of the time? And I gave four multiple choice answers, and it was a very, very interesting results. Um, anywhere from calm and confident to stressed and (laughs) befuddled most of the time. And I also got some custom answers that were outside the uh, four to choose from. So it was very educational. And the reason I sent that survey out is because I wanted to get your opinion on something I was writing in the book I'm creating. If you've been listening a while, you know I'm writing a book and I'm supposed to have it done, I think by August 1st, for hopefully a early 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 2017 release i'm working with a publisher now they've been fantastic uh, but now i have a deadline (laughs) and working against deadlines uh can be a little stressful Uh, i'm i think i'm good at writing so i'm just going to continue writing as i normally do but it is kind of hard to write an actual book instead of an ebook instead of a blog article but something that's going to have such permanence like if somebody uh, read my ebook and they found a mistake, I could update it. That's easy. I just re upload the file to Amazon and it's done. But in a book, it's a lot more permanent. It's a, it's a lot more important that I get things right. So that's why I sent out that survey to the people on my newsletter and uh, about 172 responses, which is fantastic. I am grateful for you. Thank you for responding. And then a bunch of people also wanted to join in the book launch Facebook group that I created for the book. So I invited the people who took the survey to join the book launch. And I want to thank them for being in that Facebook group and will be not only part of the launch team, 
when the book launches, but also a very important part of the content when I'm writing because I may know what I know, but I also need to know where you're at. So I have a bunch of people that have joined the Facebook group that are helping me and giving me input and giving me their opinions and where they are because I only have one perspective. I only have one lens from which to view the world. So I'm very grateful for those in the Facebook group. I'm very grateful for those who took the survey, for all the personal messages that I've been getting. And I just wanted to take the time to thank you. So thank you. Other than that, you might be thinking, what about me? (laughs) I've sent you a letter, or I gave you a donation, or I use your Amazon link. Well, you're right, damn it. (laughs) Thank you, too. Thank you so much. And every time I receive any type of compliment or praise or anything that has changed your life and you share it with me, I like to take little snippets. I save that on a specific page on my website. I have a page that I sometimes visit when uh, I feel the stresses of daily life. Yes, I get stressed too. It's not as often as it used to be uh, because I talk about this stuff all the time. I work on it all the time. I have uh, tools in my tool belt to help me get through certain situations in life. And when my brain gets overwhelmed, uh, I still need a break. I still need uh, my tools I still need resources, and um, one of those resources is the uh, praise or testimonial page. I just love visiting that on my my website and just seeing all the the lives that are changing or the people that love the show or the thank yous. It just, it warms my heart. So again, this is all about, this end segment is all about praising you and feeling grateful and feeling so honored that you are in my life. Thank you. And with that, open your mind and step into your power and be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you, you are amazing.